And now Project Veritas is back with a new video exposing what they say is the deep state. A series of undercover videos now prompting a series of investigations within the government. In this one, a Department of Justice paralegal who also belongs to the Democratic Socialists of America seems to admit to using DOJ resources to help with her cause. So ran the license plate. And joining with other employees to work against the Trump administration. In a time of weaponized information, what does it mean to be a journalist? Is undercover reporting and selective editing of content unethical, as many say? What does fake news, and for that matter, truth, really mean? And what motivates people to become whistleblowers? James O'Keefe, founder and president of Project Veritas, has some unexpected takes on these questions. The organization he founded has a mission to investigate and expose corruption and achieve a more ethical and transparent society. He is author of American Pravda, my fight for truth in the era of fake news. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellick. So James, you describe yourself as both a muckraker and as an investigative reporter, and I wanted you to give us a bit of a picture of what these roles mean to you. Well, uh, muckraking, a term I believe that was coined by Ida Tarbell, it, you know, it's, it's uh, about creating righteous indignation. It's about kind of the, the righteous indignation is the most motivating force in politics. Uh, uh, we believe at Project Veritas, and as my mentor Andrew Breitbart said, that politics and policy is downstream from the culture. So we have to inform the people. And uh, uh, journalism, investigative journalism, is from our vantage point the most powerful thing you could do to, to kind of expose the truth. So uh, I was reading a book recently and the way they put it is that investigative journalists are the custodians of conscience, that we, we allow the people to formulate a, a idea of what is and what is not moral in a society. So these sorts of things are the foundation of how people are informed. Uh, the American system of government depends upon it depends upon an informed citizenry. So I would submit to you that the American people are just not informed. It's not that they're not intelligent enough to make public policy determinations. It's just they don't have the information necessary to make informed public policy determinations. So what we need is we need muckrakers and investigative journalists to get this information in, in a raw and true form in order to help make that happen and that's what I'm committed to doing and that's what my organization Project Veritas is is the tip of the spear of this endeavor. So there's plenty of folks that d describe themselves as investigative journalists today and I guess you're suggesting that they're not actually providing that I guess you're calling it moral guidance mm -hmm. uh, uh, for society. Um, how does that work? What how, are, are people misleading us and saying that they're actually doing investigative work? Well, and to be clear, I think that journalists are providing too much moral guidance. I think the proper role of an investigative reporter is to, is to really make news judgments, is to provide people what is, what is newsworthy, not the moral opining. You know, the custodian of conscience is, is the, the you're, you're testing and affirming what is and and what is not an outrage to people by providing them with facts. And this, is, this, is, this has sort of become a cliche, but journalism today is just all about opinion. It's, it's all you know, making moral judgments about, about the news, and we're not really getting any actual raw information. And in fact, arguably, journalists think that you, you shouldn't have the raw information. The raw information is dangerous, that, that it provides, it, it creates herd instincts. That it that it that it that it, that it, it could create prejudice, and this is a little getting ahead of myself here in this interview. But when what this happens is social media companies are starting to censor raw information. That that the wrong information would lead to the wrong public policy solution, and that's we're getting too far ahead of ourselves. This all started happening in the 1960s and 70s in newspapers. They they got away from doing reporting. They Watergate happened, and 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 people viewed their positions in journalism. They wanted to become celebrities or, or they pursued power. They viewed it as a way to get power when back in the day it was all about just exposing facts. So this is why we choose 
video as the medium because it's the purest and rawest and most uninhibited form that properly educates the people. That's why we choose video in, in the way that we do. So I want to tackle a few things uh, head on here, um, specifically around using video, for example. Um, so a number of people, as, as you all know, have basically accused you of cutting your videos in such a way as to misrepresent the context of the situation. Um, can you kind of, what would you say to those people? Well, I would say that all journalism is edited, selectively so. I mean, the, the very nature of journalism is you have to edit the story to, to fit it. I mean, if you just release a torrent of, of, of gibberish and, and raw words, it, it won't make sense. You have to write the story. But the thing about video is that it's, it's, it, there's, a, there's, an, there's a beginning point and there's an end point, and it captures reality accurately. The words, and, and, I, and I have a lot of respect for like the work you guys do, but news, newspaper reporters can't capture reality as accurately as video. Because with video, you pick up on a person's intonation. You pick up on subtleties words don't pick up on. You pick up on body language. And no matter, if you're the best writer in the world, you can't, you can't pick up on all those nuances that a video camera can capture. Now, you might say, well, the video camera's edited. Well, well so are sentences. Sentences are arranged and juxtaposed in the way that the artist or the author wants. And, you know, I don't know about you, but when I read the New York Times, every day it gets worse and worse. They, they, they patronize you. They omit. And the video camera can't, I can't omit. When I film you if, in, over the course of an hour, I, I, I see what I get. So I would argue that we need more of these visuals. We need more of these cameras in, in these dark corners. And um, that's just the bottom line. They can say all the stuff that they want, but at the end of the day, I'm not lying about what I see. And I, and I get sued, and I get deposed, and I have to swear on the Bible and raise my right hand that what I saw was real. And uh, so help me God. And the other thing I'll tell you is that they say that we edit, but they never actually give you a specific example. It's all hyperbole. It's all just an accusation without a specific. If you have a specific example, of a, of a specific edit, please name it. And third, a lot of the people that we've filmed have admitted they've said what they've said and they've resigned. So if you've resigned and admitted that you've said what you've said, where is the veniality? Where is the example of the supposed deceptive editing? They simply can't name it. So do you then you know, present longer, full, unedited videos in addition to the you know, sort of the, the, the clips that you feel encapsulate the reality. We sometimes have done that. The problem is, and this, is, this has become one of their logical fallacies, is let's say it's a two-hour encounter with a subject, like the NPR investigation that we did. Mm -hmm. we, this is about seven years ago. We did a story on national public radio. We, we, it was a two- or three-hour long interview, and I decided I'm going to release the entire interview. Well, then various conspiracy theorists, this is what they did with the Planned Parenthood videos as well, will go into the raw and say, it looks like minute marker, two hour and 11 minute, is not exactly matched with the, they'll create a fictitious, and, and this is actually what happens. The, the, the conspiracy theorists will come out and say, well, this is, this is some type of problem with it. So we decided we can't possibly placate these individuals. Mm -hmm. Another thing that they'll do is if you release the full raw, they'll say, but how do we know that you didn't leave the building and then walk back in? They'll just come up with, these people will never be placated. They'll never be satisfied. Oh, and by the way, video of an encounter is above and beyond the standard that any newspaper reporter will have. You just use anonymous sources, or you just say, this is what the person said. Why don't we ask the New York Times to provide unedited notebooks and video tape? of all other quotes. It's a, it's a preposterous standard. It's a standard that no journalist could possibly abide by. At Project Veritas, I could simply release, I could say, person X said this, and not provide any video at all. So again, releasing video of quotes is a standard that goes above and beyond what any other reporter is supposed to do. And if they want to hold me to the standard of releasing raw tapes to buttress quotes, I believe that's a standard they should hold themselves to. 
so again, this is not the issue at hand. The issue is really who is a journalist, what is a journalist. Right. These are the more essential questions and the more underlying reasons why they attacked me in the first place. Well, and the, the other piece, uh, so a lot of this work that you're describing, you know, with NPR, with Planned Parenthood, this is undercover work where the journalist or you are posing as someone else. And that's been described by some people as being unethical. Right. Um, uh, what would you say to the people that, that say that? Well, I would say there's two different issues. You're, you're correct. That, 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 that is the proper response, is that, well, you're, you're secretly recording these people, right? And you're using false pretenses. Well, let's take, let's take these issues one at a time. First, the secret recording matter, right? Mm -hmm. So first of all, in each and every case where we film someone, it's always, I'm always a party to the conversation. In other words, let's say I'm secretly recording you, and you don't know that in New York City. Maybe you are. Right. Well, we're, there's t cameras all around here. <laughs> but let's say I'm secretly recording you some other place, in a restaurant or something, and you don't know that. But what you do know is that I'm talking to you. You know that, you know, and we know each other somewhat well, but we, know, we don't know each other terribly well. well I've met, we've met each other two or three times, I believe, in the past. But, but I'm kind of a stranger, and what the bottom line is, from an ethics perspective, I could be writing everything, to what you're saying down, and I could blast it to the whole world tomorrow. You have no expectation of privacy. So from an ethical perspective, I would argue that recording you does more justice than merely writing down what you say. So from an ethical or moral perspective, the secret recording is not a problem. So long as, as, as you know that you know, the recording is on me. In other words, where we would cross the line is if I put a recording device down and I walked away. That's zero party consent. We don't do that at Project Veritas. So the, the, the secret recording is not the moral quandary our opponents would lead you to believe. The other issue is the false pretense issue. That's a more tricky one. We could, that, we could talk for hours about that. I've got some things to say, but, uh, but the false pretense is we argue it's necessary. We argue that deception in some cases is required to uncover the truth because some issues are of vital, vital and profound public importance. And of course, history is replete with investigative reporters who've done this, but that's a, very, that's a more uh, complicated subject than Ask away if you wish. Well, so this is actually one of my questions. You know, what is responsible journalism? Right. You know, how, how do you see responsible journalism? In terms of the deception, for example, or well, just in general? Well, I, I think in general. Um, okay. I would, I would answer that by saying a journalist, I mean, journalism is defined, as some people have said in history, it's, it's uh, telling the truth and shaming the devil. Journalism is about, is about telling the truth to the audience. You have to be truthful. You have to give them the truth. And, and if you look through history, usually it's at any means necessary. Okay. Now, what's, where's the line? Well, for me, it's you have to tell the truth to the audience, even if it means deceiving your subject. By the way, this is not unique to me. Journalists deceive subjects all the time. I mean, journalists uh, uh, bribe, seduce. Seduction doesn't only take the form of undercover. I mean, New York Times reporters, you should hear how they talk to subjects on the phone. They make you think they're your friend. They make you think they're your best friend in the world. And then they break the story. And, all, and then the subject is, oh, how could I have possibly trusted this person? This is not unique to Project Veritas. Seduction, broadly speaking, is what most reporters do and are supposed to do to get you to trust them. Veritas does it in a different way. We, we use pretense. We use undercover techniques. Um, but the most important thing is to tell the truth to the audience. Is to, is to, and, and, and most people are more honest when they don't know they're talking to a reporter. So if you're a reporter and you're talking to a subject and that subject is feeding you BS, feeding you things that they want the public to know, well, guess what? You may not be doing responsible journalism. You may be giving the public the thing the source wants you to to give to the public. So you have to be very careful if you're a reporter and you're just relaying information. At Project Veritas, we don't have that problem as much because the person does not know that they're being recorded. And it's visual. It's video. It's real. It's cinema verite. You are capturing this person a real moment, unguarded, 
it's, it's aesthetically true, and oftentimes, in, in rare cases where they are making it up, like Nick Dudick at the New York Times saying, oh, I'm, Nick, I'm James Comey's godson, even, even in the cases where he is BSing, it becomes newsworthy. So it is a very interesting um, distinction between when the subject knows that they're being recorded and when they don't. That's very, very interesting. You know, in, a, in American Pravda, you kind of ex explore this concept of fake news, which I guess is somehow the opposite of what, what you've been describing. Um, but this term has actually been used by all sorts of people in all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. It's kind of this, it's this almost weaponized term. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what fake news means to you? Well, that's a very loaded term these days, used by both sides on, of the equation. I think, uh, I believe it was Steve Bannon who originated it, um, and Glenn Greenwald wrote a piece about that. Fake news, um, I think to me it, it, uh, it embodies this American Pravda, this, this book I wrote, it, it better encapsulates it this way. That, 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 I mean, you look at CNN as an example of a network where they, it's, it's, all, it's all about narrative. There's no actual facts. There's no actual new information. It's, it's, it's the, 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 the way they use chyrons to... Oh, but to, there's all sorts of chy breaking news. You yeah. Know, this new inf I, I don't understand what you mean. There's, there's no, no new information. There's no, there's no actual original reporting. There's no currency in investigative journalism. This is what I think. There's no... There's no actual investigative journalism happening on these platforms. It's all just opinion. It's all just, just, just talk. 95% of people, I mean, the panels, constant talking and gibberish. I don't care what you think. I want to see the information. So maybe fake is too strong of a word, but I just, it, I'm tired of the opining and the opinions and the, and the angles and the, the coloring of information. I just want to see the information. What do, I'm not a hypocrite. If you look at my stories, it's the extent of my involvement is, I'm James O'Keefe. Check this out. That's it. That's all I want you to say. I don't need to hear you. Know, so I don't know if it's fake is the right adjective, but because these people are expressing their opinions, but their opinions have no basis in reality. Their opinions have no basis in reality. We did a video last year, last year, two years ago, on the, on, the, on the Washington Post. And a guy, I believe his name is Adam Entus. I believe that was his name. Uh, uh, my colleague might know his name. But uh, he said something like, our editorial page is wrong on the Russia story. He said this. And I got so much, uh, we caught him on hidden camera saying this. And I got so much flack. And people said, well, James doesn't know the difference between an editorial page and, an, and, a, and a news page. Well, if you read um, Jill Abramson's new book, and she's no right-winger, by the way, she says the same thing. She says it's, it's, they're, they're being merged together. So if, you're, if there's no difference between your opinion page and your editorial page, if there's, if there's no difference there, then where's the real news? If the subject matter expert on the Russia investigation, not me, but the subject matter expert, Adam Entus at the Washington Post, says, listen, there's, there's, there's no difference between uh, the, the people on the opinion pages are wrong on their report. Well, then what is their opinion based in if it's not based in fact or reality? And if 90 to, to 100% of what we're seeing on cable news networks is opinion with no basis in reality, then yes. To answer your question, that is fake news. So President Trump has uh, called out various journalists and various media at time as fake news. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people have said that that's actually undermining, he, by doing so, he's undermining the credibility of the profession um, in, in its entirety. How do you see that? I actually think one of the greatest virtues of this president is, and one of the greatest synergies with this president between what we're doing is, is waking, getting people woke uh, about, about media. The media, I mean, let, let me just make this clear to your audience. The media has all the power. All the power. They have, I mean, it's, it, the media is everything. 
people say, well, the media, no, the, everything is downstream from media. And by media, I don't just mean CNN and the New York Times. I mean Silicon Valley also. The, the, the social media, the social media companies. Yeah. They, they are media companies, you know, because the CNN, New York Times, NBC News circulate their messages through social media. They work together. They, they distribute, I mean, they distribute their messaging together. In some cases, they have business arrangements together. That's what Nick Dudick told us at the New York Times about his relationship with YouTube. He works with the people. So the media has all the power. So I think one of the greatest virtues of Trump is his ability to get people to think about whether what they're getting is real, to question. This is, some would consider his biggest problem. I think it's his great, greatest virtue of Trump is making people question and be skeptical of what they see. The Pravda, the difference between the Soviet Pravda, Pravda was the Russian word for right. Soviet newspaper, is that everyone in the Soviet Union knew that it was a joke. They knew that they were being it's lied so to. It's ironic. It's truth. Pravda is truth. Pravda right? is the word truth yeah. in, in, in Russian. They knew that it, was, that it was a lie, but they just didn't have the moral courage to do anything about it. So in other words, the vast majority of people in the Soviet Union said, this is a bunch of BS, but if I protest, they'll send me to the gulag. In the United States, I would say more than 50% of people actually believe a lot of the lies in the media. So the greatest virtue of this president is calling attention to that and making people question, maybe this is not real. Getting people to wake up. Of course, the media, um, they, they're just happy because they're making more money than ever being negative and antagonistic towards this guy. So that's where we are right now. So uh, you've actually said before this concept of media having all the power. You just mentioned this. You've actually said before that it has more power than the legislative branch Correct. of government. Correct. 100%. Can you unpackage that for me? Yes. That's, that's well, hard to fathom. Well, it's 100% true. The media has more power than all three branches of government. And um, I'm not the one who originated this. This was a man named Alexander Solzhenitsyn who said it in his Harvard address to a bewildered commencement. You know, the, all these Harvard people expected this Alexander Solzhenitsyn to, to, uh, you know, to, to say what they wanted him to say. And he goes, the media has more power than all three branches of government combined. I mean, think of that for a second, because that's very counterintuitive, right? But, but, but let me explain that, because this is very important. When you turn on the TV, these legislators, do they actually do any legislating, or do they spend most of the time in front of a camera on CNN? They understand this, that, 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 that politics is downstream from an informed population. And most people get their information from the media. And the media is not limited to CNN, the New York Times, NBC News. It also includes Google, Facebook, and Twitter. So you better believe that these politicians spend most of their time dealing with CNN, the New York Times, NBC, Facebook, Google, and Twitter. Trump has chosen to, to be antagonistic with these organizations. So I think that that, 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 that that is an inflection point in American history right now, right here. And uh, I believe that Solzhenitsyn is and was correct. And Andrew Breitbart taught this to me. He, he was my mentor. And he said, James, the media is not just something to consider. He said, the media is everything. It's everything. Andrew Breitbart, who himself was mentored by Ariana Huffington and Matt Drudge. Andrew Breitbart edited the Drudge Report when I met him. He said, James, the media is everything. He said that you have to get out in front. You have to, you know, I was arrested at the time in New Orleans. And he said, talk to the New York Times. He said, talk to these organizations. Don't cower. Don't be in a fetal position. Get out in, in, in front of the story. Um, I don't think people realize this. Um, but when they do realize it, it, it changes your strategy. You, you, it, it affects how you, how you conduct yourself and, and how you approach these issues. So I guess Project Veritas, we could see it as being a kind of a new media mm -hmm. in a way. I mean, I suppose the Epic Times is also a kind of a new media. And so how, how, does this, how do new media contrast with 
and I hesitate to say the word traditional, but mm -hmm. let's say the mainstream media, what we think of more conventionally as the, the big media in our society? So this is a very good question. Um, on one hand, I would say stop complaining about the media and sort of become the media. And what does that mean? You know, you guys started a, a newspaper, which is a Herculean effort. In our case, I think what, what I would say to you is that we don't want to create a media or create a, a media company that like other companies create their company and have their little you know distribution we want to get covered by the mainstream media in other words our model and this is not our model it's a vision i suppose for for the citizens is get in the new york times get on cbs this is what breitbart taught me he said get covered by them now this is very counterintuitive to to a uh, independent-minded person who criticizes these venues, and I just did criticize them. However, as critical as I am of these organizations, I recognize that of their, their power. In other words, here in Manhattan, where we are right now, if it is not in the New York Times, it does not exist to the people in Manhattan. Now, so people would criticize me and say, well, James, you're giving them too much power. I say, yes, but we can still get covered by the New York Times if the story is big enough. If the story resonates, if the story is powerful, if the content is strong enough, if the Epic Times breaks a massive story on, you name the scandal in the Justice Department, you just make it the New York Times to cover the fruits of your labor. If the Justice Department scandal the Epic Times uncovers is so big and embroils various executives in the Justice Department that those folks get subpoenaed or themselves resign, the New York Times has to cover the results of your labor. So the vision, therefore, is to do journalism. The vision is to do journalism to such a degree and to such a scale that it forces the non-journalists to cover the journalism that you do. You see? That's the vision. That these people, may, that, and by the way, there are some good journalists out there in these mainstream publications. There's still some of them, a few of them. Maybe I can count them on one hand. In any event, if we do the journalism ourselves and we do it right and we, and we be the change we wish to see in the world, and we, li and, we, and we set the example, we will force the mainstream media to cover our work. That's the vision behind Project Veritas, but I would argue it's really not my vision, it's a vision for the citizenry, and I'm just trying to be a facilitator. I'm trying to let people know that you can do this. This is not, you don't need a journalism degree, you don't need to work for an established publication. You actually, what you really need is the moral courage and the willingness to go out and just go do it. And the metrics will be how many New York Times front pages will you get to be forced to cover your work. This is like the holy grail of, of results. A New York Times headline above the fold covering something that you've done. So that's my vision to answer your question about a vision for how to, to interact with or replace media. Well, it's very interesting that you would say that because, you know, a few weeks back, I can't remember, it's pretty much exactly what happened for us, except the story was spun so wildly that the headline, I believe, was something to the effect that the president was, had been under investigation for being a Russian agent. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I think it was, I counted nine paragraphs into it. Um, there was a line saying, well, but there's no evidence, there was no evidence to support this. Mm -hmm. Right. So, anyway, very, very interesting that you say that. I, I guess we're, we're on the right track according to your school of you, journalism. You, you need to keep doing it. You need to keep going. Yes, you're, you're on the right track. And I would say you keep that momentum. Maybe the next story, they'll be forced to admit there was evidence. I'll give you one quick, two quick examples. We did this in the New York Times. The New York, I'm using New York Times as a scapegoat here. But with the ACORN investigation, Congress, this has happened in 2009. We did this investigation into ACORN. Uh, I posed as a pimp, and um, we did all these offices. It was a long story, big story, put, put uh, Project Veritas on the map. The, the, both houses of Congress were democratically controlled, and the House and Senate voted overwhelmingly to defund ACORN because of the videos that, that Hannah and I did before the New York Times even assigned a reporter to the story. The New York Times then had to print their ombudsman printed an apology to their readers saying we tuned in too late. The, the, it was written by Clark Hoyt 
in March. It was actually written in September of 2009, and it said, tuning in too late. And they apologized for not only not covering the story, but saying in the future they would assign an additional reporter to cover stories that we broke. Now that, now that is unbelievable. And in 2016, the New York Times printed an A-section story on our story on Democracy Partners, where I believe the headline was something to the effect of um, democratic operative caught doing dirty tricks. So this is, this is certainly possible. I mean, it's like one small step for man, one giant leap for citizen journalism. One step on the moon, hopefully there'll be more steps. But the answer is absolutely. You guys are on the right track. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Keep doing it. Thanks, James. So you actually have a whole new crop of uh, young undercover journalists, uh, I understand, uh, you know, from December and January who are, you know, doing, doing this work. And then mm -hmm. I understand there's uh, some news that's going to come out of this work that they're doing. Can you give us any, any previews here? Well, yeah, we've been, we, we, um, we're very busy during the election cycle. We, we broke some dozen stories on various senators, governors, some of which prompted some resignations in Florida and Missouri and elsewhere. And in, in the last two months, we've been just very busy recruiting uh, undercover journalists and even recruiting some people on the inside of these various institutions. I would say one of our big focuses right now is Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. um, some of these large tech companies like Google and, and Facebook and, and Twitter, excuse me, um, people on the inside are so fed up by what they are witness to that, and some of them are quite aligned with uh, some of the things I've said here in this interview, that they've, okay. they've proactively reached out to me. And some of those people themselves are willing to wear a camera. So you may see imminently some things happen there. That we're in New York State here where the uh, uh, Andrew Cuomo just recently passed a law regarding the um, uh, issue involving late-term abortion right. and some things happening on that issue and in, in some, some, some matters involving some post-birth issues where right now a bill is being uh, uh, debated. Senator Ben Sasse is talking about that, so there's that issue. And I would say there's the education issue, which you guys have done a great job of covering. I, I love your, your insert in your newspaper about the education issue I saw. Um, and then there's the election of 2020. There's a lot going on in this country. So my job is to find the, the um, I guess you could say, the unreasonable man who is willing to um, uh, strap a camera to themselves and and do the unthinkable. And these are not easy people to find. And uh, is a lot of work training them and, and uh, equipping them before we send them out. So we've spent the last two months getting a whole new crop of people. And, and you'll see in the next 30 days some new stories come out. So this part of the new people that are in this crop is fascinating. But you mentioned that there's actually people on the inside yes. that you've connected with or they've reached out to you and they're wearing cameras and yes. speaking from the inside. What compels someone to do such a thing? So we were, you and I were sort of talking about this um, off the air recently, and I think that we've done a lot of thinking and reading and studying the characteristics of these people, and some of these things are sort of trade secrets. But I can tell you that the number one commonality that the people who do this, and I'm not talking about just an undercover journalist, I'm talking about someone who actually blows the whistle. You guys deal with that, uh, your colleagues yes, find those people, and you, 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 you have a unique uh, expertise on this as well. It seems to me they all share what I call a justice complex. Okay. They're so passionate, They're, they believe so deeply. Um, one of the people that we are talking to actually said that I found, what the I found what this organization was doing is so bad that I felt the public had a right to know. I felt like the public had a right to know. And, I, and it's almost like their commitment to that idea is greater than whatever marginal 
actually quite significant sacrifice that they themselves would make in their personal lives. Their belief in something is greater than their belief in worrying about their safety, if that, if that makes sense. And these people do exist. They're out there. Um, I would say the vast majority of people are afraid and are so concerned with their own well-being. What I'm in, interested in are the people who are not as concerned in their own well-being. And it kind of takes a somewhat unreasonable person. But most progress in human society is based upon the unreasonable person pushing the boundaries. So what I realize is that Project Veritas needs to find the unreasonable people who are on the inside, who believe so deeply. Now, who are these people like actual examples? Well, Ed Snowden is, is, is a, an, an example. Some people don't like him. But let's assume, let's just take him for what he is. He, he was the personification of someone who just basically said, blew himself up to expose the National Security Agency. And he changed the world. He changed policy. James Damore, Google. Here's a guy who was an unwitting whistleblower. He was blown up by a memorandum. Um, these are not very many people like this. Most people are afraid, but I think we are at a point in American history, our country, it, it seems to be on the brink, doesn't it? It seems to be like there's, the, the center cannot hold, things fall apart. There's a brewing civil war of sorts culturally that these people exist. I cannot tell you, unfortunately, in this interview, the nature of where these people are, but I can tell you that Project Veritas has recruited a bunch of them. A bunch of people like that. And some of them are retired. Some of them are not. Some of them are on the inside. Some of them work in elections. Some, some of them work in Silicon Valley. And it's now it's my job to create an army of them, which is what we're going to do. And they all share in common the justice complex. Very interesting. So I, I noticed that you're actually promoting your tip line a lot in your Twitter feed and in social media and so forth. And uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll put that up on the screen so people can see it. And um, so how many tips do you actually get a month? Uh, uh, we, we, get, we get hundreds, if not thousands, um, and it's growing. I, and how many are credible? You know, <laughs> I'm sure you get a lot of stuff which you... You, you know, yeah, it, it, there's different, there's different uh, 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 things that we get. So we get people who want to be full-time journalists, for example. We get thousands of those. We get thou a thousand applications to become a journalist. Um, we get people that, who have ideas on, for example, one such idea would be, have you thought about going into Acorn dressed as a prostitute? I mean, this is just an idea, but it's a good idea, and I did it. <laughs> we get I, uh, tips um, uh, that are people on the inside who are informants, right? Who, who are on the inside, who have access to something but are not willing to film. This is like a common anonymous source. Right. Um, but because we're a visual organization, we have to corroborate that. And then we have what I call unicorns. People who are on the inside, who have access, who are morally courageous, and who are willing to film. These are the people that we're focused on. Now, your question is, how many of our total tips are the unicorns? I mean, listen, one out of every 10,000 or something like this. Mm -hmm. But we have a process. And yes, I, I, in this interview, I would solicit people to go to projectveritas.com. If this is you, if, you know, I'd, I'd like to make a call to action here before the end of the interview, but we definitely want people to, um, to think about their purpose in life and why why they were put here. I mean, life is about more than, you know, you know commodities and, 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 and having a house and getting by. This is a way for you to serve your country. Just like people go to war, people do a lot of things. People run for office. This is a way to serve your country, to inform your fellow man. If you are witness to something, if, if you're a janitor, a school teacher, a union member, government worker and you hear here and you see something and you're disgusted by it I can equip you I can equip you be brave about it do something people say what can I do well you can do something you can film it 
And you don't have to be willing to film or to, to talk to you? Or do you? Do you have to be ready to film? You don't have to be ready to film. Okay. There's two different types of people. Okay. There's the people who are, have access to this, who, who see it, who know it, and who can talk to us anonymously. There's those people. And then there are, there are people who sort of say, this, is, this rises to the standard that I'm, I'm willing to, 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 to film it and maybe even be known for doing so. And, and there's two different types of people. Now, some of the people in the first category just need a little bit of convincing or hand-holding to become the second category. Um, I've already found dozens of people who are willing to actually do it. So that, that's my call to action. And I think, I, I, I actually believe that once these people come out of the woodwork and actually show themselves and get up on the stage, so to speak, get up on the world stage, I think there'll be more and more and more and more. They've awakened a sleeping giant. They can stop one man, but they can't stop a thousand people. And Project Veritas will have, in the next few years, a thousand people doing this. Whenever you publish one of these videos, there's probably a lot of people that are quite angry. Oh, what they see. That's an understatement. <laughs> um, well, it ends up being kind of tough, maybe lonely work. Which, like, how, how, do you, how do you deal with that? That is really an interesting question. Blowing the whistle is, there was an article in the New Yorker, I believe it was last week or two weeks ago, about a whistleblower who did the Ketam, uh, right. Ketam lawsuits on the government. And um, I guess that's a little bit of a different situation, I suppose, because the key tam, it's, it's, you're working for the FBI. You know, you, some, some would say you're like a snitch or something like this, but no, it's, it's honorable work. It's a little bit different than this because you're going directly to the people. I cannot tell you how gratifying it is because people say, well, what's in it for me? Or what's in, well, Project Veritas will protect you. Project Veritas will, will pay your legal bills. Project Veritas will employ you pay you a full-time salary. But there's something so gratifying about breaking these stories and educating people about the atrocities. And actually, if the story is good enough, if it's really, really bad, um, I think what's going to happen, as Martin Luther King says, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, you know. So in the beginning, they might try to play games. But over time, Leviathan will actually not retaliate, okay? I am a living and breathing example of this. I am a free man. I am not in jail. I was in jail before. Uh, Andrew Cuomo did indeed. This is, we're in New York State. My headquarters is, is in uh, Westchester, New York. Andrew Cuomo in 2014 did indeed try to shut me down and audit me and do all these things. But over time, he sort of backed off. He backed off. In other words, I think these powerful organizations and powerful corporations and powerful people that we investigate and the whistleblowers uh, investigate will not retaliate against the whistleblowers if we create an army of people doing it because it's in the public interest, because it's the right thing to do, because it's the morally courageous and the correct thing to do. What are they going to do? Retaliate against innocent people? who blew the whistle on something so shocking to the conscience. We're talking about things that shock the conscience. We're talking about deeds so bad and so evil that 98% of people think they're wrong. You're telling me that some mega corporation is going to put their big thumb and squish these people? I hope they do. That'll only make the story bigger, you see? So it's exactly what Saul Linsky argued. It's, it's, it's a push a negative large enough and it breaks through to its counter side. So, long way of answering your question, but I believe that these people get so much gratification from breaking these stories, and I believe that the public will thank them, and I believe that there's more to life than, you know, than just going about your day. There's noble purpose. There's serving people. Don't people want to serve? Isn't that what life is about? This is about service. This is the most, as far as I'm concerned, and maybe as far as you're concerned, why we were put on this earth is to educate people and to serve a purpose. And I think there's millions of people in the United States who agree with that. So I don't need a million people. I just need about 100, and, they, and, I, and I will find them. 
Well, this is a wonderful place to finish up. Thank you so much, James, for this, uh, you know. Thank you.